Hi there, and welcome to Muse Jam Session Recording 178. My name is Danny Beaumont, and I'm a product manager on the Adobe Muse team. Today's session, we're going to focus on typography. We're using a new screen share tool called Zoom, and as it goes, looks like I've got Ollie Pordelli in the house, so I think he's going to help me out with chat a little bit. You're welcome to either use the chat pod or a Q&A pod. If you have questions that you think you want me to address, I will stop and check that Q&A pod from time to time. Uh, I think Ollie will give me a hand in chat a little bit. Hello, Mr. Pordelli. He's saying hi. So that would be great. Um, as I mentioned, if you want to make sure it's something I cover on the topic, you can put it in that Q&A pod or just put it in chat. And uh, I will stop in as we go along. Uh, I may be joined by some of my colleagues from the Muse team. I'll keep an eye out for that. But today's session is all on typography and Muse. Um, there was a poll that was up a moment ago that asked about how many folks have experience with Muse. And it looks like for the folks we have on board right now, you've built at least a site or two using Muse and have some familiarity. So that's great. Um, this is kind of a door-to-door -door tour on typography within the application. So I'm going to take it from the beginning, um, but we'll dive in a little bit more deeply uh, pretty quickly. So with that said, I'm going to start sharing my screen, which I've been doing, um, and jump over to the Muse application. Actually, before we even jump into that, um, I want to, I'm going to close out a couple things here. I'm still getting used to this new tool. I think you'll find that the audio on your end is better. Um, I know performance on my end is better with this tool, so I'm pretty pleased to have it on board. Looks like we've got Stephanie in the house. So Stephanie will also uh, help out with chat a bit as we go along. Stephanie is an interface designer on the team. She's responsible for the user experience and some of the uh, graphics and such that we develop as part of the tool, some of our demo assets. So welcome, Stephanie. Um, Stephanie, you and Ollie Pordelli are going to keep an eye on chat and the Q&A pod as we go along. Okay, looks like Mr. Awesome's here as well, so I'm going to throw him in as a panelist as well. So Colby uh, is from our quality engineering team. What we tend to do in these sessions, we call it a jam session because we both work together, both you and us, or you and I. Um, as we go along, if you have questions, if there's things that are going on with the tool, you're welcome to put that into the chat and share it. Uh, we can help solve them. This is our opportunity to hear what's going on for you these weeks and get feedback about your world as we share what's new with us as well. Uh, the, what I have here running actually in the browser right now is a site that's built with Muse. See if I can make one of these pods go away for me. There we go. So this site is built in Adobe Muse. Uh, we've showed it in the past when we first delivered Typekit integration to the Muse application. And this is built by one of our users. His name is Aaron Lawrence. And he's this rare combination of an incredible typographer, all in the package of a fellow who's only about, we'll just say he's in his early 30s. Um, but he comes from a family of designers and just has a real passion for typography. And he presented at Adobe Max for us last year and produced this example just to really show off some of the amazing aspects of type in the browser and how you can really push the envelope. I'm gonna actually copy this URL and just put it into the chat real quick, um, make it a little easier for folks to see it. So that's one URL. There's another one I'm going to throw into the chat right now that we'll talk about a little bit more in a second, um, which is a terrific teaching tool. But these are both developed by Aaron and uh, are just really amazing. It actually says in this first example, example sessions with typography, uh, in the footer we have a bit of a caveat where we talk about uh, kids don't try this at home. It's not for your average website. But in it, we have 49 different fonts in 62 different faces and five styles, five typographic styles. The point here is you shouldn't do this in a web browser. It's way too heavy. It's too much text to load in the browser. But it's kind of a really interesting use case, if you ask me. And that it shows off how even when you have that many fonts 
loaded in a single web page. They load rather quickly. Um, the site is relatively light for so many fonts. Now, best practices around typography as web designers have always really said you want to be very sparing with the amount of fonts that you use. So we have streamlined the process by which you as a designer pick fonts for your website. It's pretty um, seamless uh, in that you simply can go into the Muse interface, select the different typefaces you want to work with, and we're going to talk about that range. Um, even if you're working with web fonts, what happens in that instance is they're going to dynamically load into your site. And the speed with which your page will load is somewhat affected by the amount of fonts that you have. Again, this is kind of a very extreme corner case, uh, and it loads both on the phone and desktop. But it loads pretty darn quickly for so many, many fonts. So kind of a celebration of typography and Adobe Muse right here. I'm going to switch over to the Muse application. And I'm going to honestly, this is that site that I've shown you from Aaron. It's kind of funny to see how it's built. He put a whole bunch of text there on basically on rotation, so a 90 degree rotation. Um, so it's kind of incredibly large or wide, I guess, is a good way to put it. But the site is a very tall scroll effects site as it's built. But let's kind of step away from that for a moment. I'm just going to start from scratch. This is not so much about designing for a project as much as really reviewing all of the ways that you can work with typography in your design. So I'm just going to come into a pretty small little page here and just play a little bit with text. So one of the first things I'm going to do is go to grab some text that's easy. Um, for any of you that kind of perhaps grew up in the world of print, there's this idea of lorem ipsum or greeking, which is for position only text. I'm a big fan of, uh, let's see, coffee ipsum maybe? Lorem coffee? <laughs> we could always do, how about, I don't know, let's go hipster. I'm not feeling bacon right now. The point is that it, this is an easy way to come in and just grab some sample text as you're working. So uh, let's go for a little bit of, <laughs> of uh, hipster text here. I'm just going to copy it out of the browser. So uh, one of the simplest ways to introduce text into your Muse application is to just copy from another application, copy from a browser, and paste within Muse. If you find that you're repeatedly integrating blocks of text with, with the Muse application, you're welcome to save out text as a .txt file, a text file format. You can then say file place and place text in that manner. Um, this is obviously unstyled text that I've just placed on the canvas. Now, we're going to kind of compare a little bit around approaches for text. So I'm going to just set this up a little bit. I'm going to give you a few examples to start with. Now, if you come from the world of print, um, you probably know the difference, obviously, between vector content and image content. So a perfect example is back in the day, if you were working on a headline and you typeset that headline in Photoshop and then saved it with an image, that text is going to flatten or become a graphic, an image. So it's not resolution independent. It's really just like a photograph, but you'll have text objects that are there. A more advanced way to do typesetting would be to keep it as vector content or image, image resolution content. So an example would be if you were an InDesign and you placed an image that was part of a logo, but you actually set the text with that image in a tool like Illustrator, let's say. Illustrator allows you to save that text as either outlines, so it becomes vector resolution independent containers, or a font that would then load if that font was available to the viewer of the site. And that vector world is one that we're going to talk about here now in just within the Muse application. So I've got these three different blocks of text that I want to show you real quickly. And in the first example, I'm going to come in and select a font to work with. So I'll select the objects. Um, I'm going to pull down under File to go to uh, Add or Remove Web Fonts, in essence. And this is where I can come and add. Actually, before I jump in here, let's start in the other area. So if I come with these objects selected into my text panel, see if I can 
move a couple things out of the way here. Notice I've got a text panel, and this is where I have many of the attributes I can associate with text within the Muse application. And you can see that I can come in here with this selected and actually choose the font that I want to work with. Now I've been using Muse for a while and I've got some fonts that have been loaded and have been used more recently. So my text drop down here is populated. If you're new to Muse, you'll see a lot less coming up here. But notice that they break into categories. I've got my recently used area. I've got web fonts. Um, I also, a little lower down here, have standard fonts and system fonts. And I'll be honest, um, starting from the bottom, these are what we would suggest are the types of fonts you want to use as little as possible, and that's system fonts. And we actually stated here that those fonts will be exported as an image. So the idea is that, um, let's say you want to work with a typeface, and you have a client, and the client has a logo, and you want to include the logo that in your design, and for some reason it's a, a particular font um, that you're working with. Anything that you select that is a system font Muse is going to automatically convert that font to an image for you. So there's the advantage there. The disadvantage is that it's going to be an image, and we'll talk about how that's really not a terrific way to go as you're designing for many, many different screens. I am going to go ahead and start and select something here. Let's say for some reason I need to work with, I'm going to try to pick something that I know really isn't on the web. Uh, without being too terribly frightening. Um, let's just go with, oh, lovely. Well, <laughs> it's spring. We'll do Harrington. It's so springy. Um, sorry, I know it hurts your eyes a bit. But notice what's happened when I change that to the, the system font. I'm going to make this headline a little larger, perhaps a little smaller in the text department as well. But when I selected that particular typeface, I'm going to zoom in here just to accentuate it. A logo comes up that's indicating to me that that text is going to be converted to an image. It's kind of a warning to you. If that is known to you and you don't really want to be reminded about it on a regular basis, you can select in preferences to not show that icon anytime you do select a font that's going to be converted to an image. But it is kind of a warning, letting you know what the behavior will be there. Let's go to the second block of text and choose uh, something, I guess, the next one up in the hierarchy, which is standard fonts. So back in the day, maybe, maybe 10 years ago, there was the idea that there were a number of browsers that were out there. And as a designer, if you didn't know the fonts that the viewer of your website would have available on their machine, if you chose a standard font, it could be trusted that they would somewhat be consistently represented on each of the viewers platforms, um, devices, and browsers. Now the truth is that they used to be called web safe fonts, I believe. Um, it's not all that safe, it's not all that consistent. Uh, there's kind of a class of device or class of fonts that are used in the world of standard fonts. So you notice here if I were to choose Georgia for that font, listed in the little tooltip and in gray there below it is what's known as fallbacks. So we're, we're suggesting go ahead and select this font um, as Georgia. On certain devices, when Georgia isn't available, we're going to fall back to Palatino, Times, and then when all else fails, we'll pretty much pick any old serif that we can that happens to be on that device. So the advantage here is that this is the first time that that font will not be treated as an image. It's going to remain a, a font uh, that is something that's vector, that will be resolution independent, that will load pretty quickly. As you can tell, it's not the biggest range of uh, typefaces to choose from in this bucket of standard fonts. So yes, they're somewhat available, but um, design-wise, they're quite limited. The next bucket that we'll talk about is this idea of web fonts that are available to us. And there's two areas, well, there's a few areas around web fonts that we'll talk about. And I'm going to go to that section. Notice in my list here, there's a couple different kinds of web fonts that we're looking at. Some are just considered web fonts, um, and this is based on the Google uh, web font open license. So it basically allows people to work with a number of open source typefaces 
And there's about five, 600 that are in that library to work with. There's also um, a lot of these green icons that indicate type kit. So if you are a licensee of Muse and you're part of the Creative Cloud, part of your Creative Cloud license allows you to access a few thousand type kit fonts. And these are very much premium typefaces. There's a broad, broad range of typefaces to choose from and you can access those. For this third bucket, let's not go with type kit quite yet, but I'm gonna select these two and I'm gonna go ahead and pick one of the web, web safe fonts, I'm sorry, one of the web fonts that I have loaded from the Google open source library. So we'll go with Stint Ultra Condensed. Now that's pretty darn ultra condensed. So I'm gonna pump this up a little bit uh, so that we can see it a bit more. And without doing much else, I wanna do a quick preview in browser and show you some of the effects of what we've done. So let me do this. I'm gonna take everything but that first chunk and I'm just gonna cut it. I don't wanna have it on the canvas for a moment. I'm gonna pull down on file to preview the page in the browser. So Muse is gonna render this page for me. And here I have that block of text. And if I look, I'm viewing it actual size. And even on my computer, um, that really funny little font that's very serify and um, has a whole lot of details uh, is looking pretty fuzzy on my machine. If I come in and zoom in in the browser to exaggerate that, uh, you can really see how the font is being represented, but it's an image, and that image is not resolution independent. So as I zoom in on it, you may or may not be able to see it clearly on your screen, it's looking pretty rough. I can tell it's an image if I just drag off here. Notice that the whole thing comes as a blob. That's because it's been made into a graphic, an image. If I zoom back out and get back to normal size here, so go back to actual size, I can also come in and right click on the page and view my page source. And when I look at that page source, there's some basic code that we put on a page. But notice here, there's a source element that says image ping, right? Um, and that is the graphic or the image representation of that. It's loading right now here, but that's one of the graphics. So here's my little headline um, with Kombucha Gastropub there in the text. Now the interesting thing about it here for a moment is that yes, it's represented as an image because we knew that was a font that's not gonna be on most people's systems, it's on my local machine, but if I previewed in the browser or published to the browser, viewers of that page would probably not have that same typeface on their computer. We do do you a favor though, if you need to use a system font, you want to make sure that the image that is being represented in the browser is search engine optimized and screen reader optimized for people that are visually impaired. So I came back here for a moment and went to my design. I'm going to check this. I bet you I'm not sharing my screen at the moment. I'm going to check chat. I might have lost you guys for a second there. No, it looks like you guys are good. It might have just been momentary. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Somebody shout out if we're in trouble. Uh, okay. So let's come in and change this headline to Hello World. Chat says, all good. I like all good. Thanks. Okay, so if I come in and say Hello World, and uh, once again, preview in browser, and once again, look at that page source. My graphic element here, if I take a look at it, there's Hello World. But interestingly enough, next to that is something known as an alt tag. See how this code right here says Hello World. What that's doing is taking the text that is rendered in that image, and it's making sure it's available for search engines, and for screen readers, people that are visually impaired. So if a visual impaired individual rolls over that graphic, um, a screen reader will read the words out loud to them. That's a really good thing. So you don't have to worry too much if you're forced to use a system font that it will be optimized for the web as much as possible. We will optimize that and that's automatically done uh, by the Muse application. 
Now, if I come back in here and I paste those other examples, let's kind of take a look at the behavior of all three of these. Actually, let's be fair for a moment. Let's get rid of the hello world, go back to that headline, and let's paste the other two comparisons in the browser here. And once again, I'm going to come in and preview in browser. Now, as I get larger here, you can start to see the real differences. So the font on the left is using that image or that resolution dependent instance. The one in the middle, it's not anything stylish. Um, it's a fallback font, of, as we've said, but it is resolution independent. It will load on devices very, very quickly, and it's served up actually from the person's device. So nothing needs to load from the web in order to see it. Now the one on the right is probably gonna be the one that's gonna give you the greatest creative expressiveness. You can choose, as I mentioned, from thousands of fonts. The way the world works there is when the viewer of your site has internet access, a quick, quick query goes to the Typekit servers that Adobe owns and serves up this font in the browser very, very fast, dynamically. Now, if the viewer of your site is offline, you might be wondering how they're gonna actually get to the web page, but let's say they already loaded the web page, they hop on an airplane. If they don't have Typekit available and a live internet connection, the page will load, but it will probably fall back to a font that's on that person's machine, rather than the true Typekit design. So this sort of takes us back to that design that I would shown you, um, from Aaron Lawrence, which had all of those Typekit fonts. On one hand, you want to be very careful to make sure that you don't use this many fonts um, in a, a single design, but you can rest assured that when you do work with them in a prudent way, they're going to load very, very quickly and very, very high resolution. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the hosting of fonts. We've talked about this Typekit instance, and Typekit is, as I mentioned, a few thousand typefaces that are out there, but it's not everything. There's, I mean, depending on what you want to count, there's over 20,000 fonts that are out there in the world. And a foundry like Typekit, or let's say a service like Typekit, that pulls fonts from many, many different type foundries, they may have lots of what's out there and popular in the market, but there may be a new hip font that you would like to work with because you're a hipster and you like hipster Greek in here. Um, if there's a hip font that you want to work with and it is not part of the Typekit library, you can self-host a font as well. And let's look at some examples of that. There are services, um, let's say if I go to um, Font Squirrel. So Font Squirrel is uh, a service that has lots and lots of typefaces. Many of them are free, many can be licensed. Uh, if you have a particular design you're looking for and it's accessible here, what you can do is either download the font for free or download it for a fee and self-host that font. So you can include it as part of your website when you publish to the web your Muse design. Now there's another um, interesting feature here with Font Squirrel, which is if you have a typeface that's not optimized for the web, so um, it's something that you have in what's known as a TTF or a true type font format or OTF, open type font, these are typefaces that were originally designed for print for your system. They may not have been generated or designed for the web, but this web font generator will allow you to take that source font and convert it into a format that's appropriate for the web. So you'll notice there's some nuances here that says, do you have permission to do that? And if you upload a font that's been basically protected from being converted to a web font, you'll be alerted here. It'll let you know that the license really does not allow it to happen. But if there are fonts that you'd like to serve up and you can't find a web version of that font, this free generator tour from, from Font Squirrel is really a nice way to go. So however it is, whether or not you buy a font, you download it for free, or you convert one that you may already own, You'll have a series of elements that are important for hosting that font on the web. And if I switch over here, let's see, I have a gathering of kind of random bits that I've found from time to time. 
So depending on what I was after, um, there's different fonts that I've worked with. For example, uh, here's just a silly one. It's called Two Ps. And if I do a quick preview of it, I'm going to click on the True Type font and just hit the space bar. It's a number of graphic elements. And this enters into kind of an interesting area. Um, you as a designer can choose how you represent icons in your design. You can, for example, if you had all of these elements as SVG or scalable vector graphic elements, you can place SVGs in Muse. And in a lot of ways, an SVG is just like a typeface and that it's vector content, it'll load very quickly, it'll be resolution independent. But you have to keep a library of icons around, and that may or may not be handy for you. It's possible to take a number of graphic elements and save them out as a font or a typeface so that you can access them very easily in your design. And that kind of takes us to another area on the web. So instead of good old font squirrel, if I go to font awesome, Font Awesome is a service of icons that are available, they're open source, I think in almost all instances, and they have lots and lots of lots of different graphics, different images for different topics. So let's say you're working with a client and you want to come in and develop a series of icons for the site, and you want to have a really simple way of having those available in your app. What you can do is come into the Font Awesome interface here and create a typeface. So you can come in and search for icons. Let's say I know I'm sending email correspondences. I can say email and get a list of a number of different email icons or just mail. And I see envelopes for mailing. I can see mails. There you go. Uh, Whatever it is I'm working on, I can create a gathering of all the icons that I want to have available. From here, I can save that out as a font, and that font is going to behave just like one I might have gotten from uh, Font Squirrel, for example. Also, fonts.com and Monotype have a number of typefaces that you can purchase and keep as a local font that you, so, that you can serve up as part of your website. So a great way to kind of create your own icon font set. You can also buy and download some that have been already prepared. And that's an example of what this guy would be here. When you are looking at self-hosting a font, there's a number of elements that Muse is going to look for to have available in order to do that work. So one is a true type font. And if you download a self-hosted font, you're going to want to double click that true type icon. Um, to install it on your system because you do need to have in the system folder a font available that you can use to typeset on the design canvas within Muse. When you preview in browser or publish on the web, the web browser is going to take over and use the other font format. So EOT, SVG, and the WAF format here. Um, are leveraged by web browsers to render that font in the browser. Now, if you notice this particular font, it's not a light font, it's got lots of graphics. Notice I've got an SVG that's about 100K, I've got um, the WAF file that's 35K. This is the overhead that you want to keep in mind if you were to use a self hosted web font that you're publishing as part of your design. So the load time on that web page may be impacted by the values we're seeing here if it needs to load that font probably once across a site. It wouldn't have to be reloaded across other pages. But you are, instead of making a query to a Typekit server or relying on a font that's already on the viewer of your website's machine, you're including it. It's like an extra image that you're uploading as part of your site. It's going to be a source for the fonts that are used in the site, but it, that resource does need to be available. Let me show you now how I would go about accessing either a self-hosted font or a Typekit font in the Muse interface. So I'm working with a client. I know I need to have a different typeface that I've not loaded up before. What I can do is pull down on File to add and remove web fonts. I can also access this in the text panel in the drop-down. There's an Add Font button there that I could choose. 
And notice that we break out different classes of fonts. I spoke about the Edge web fonts, and this is leveraging this Google open font standard. And this is just, again, um, open standard fonts uh, over five, 600 that you can access. Um, there's the self-hosted bucket, which we'll talk about in just a second, and then the Typekit button. So in some of our more recent releases, when we introduced Typekit, we also allowed you to start to um, make decisions about the fonts you want to use using somewhat of a font picker here in the interface. So you'll notice that Typekit, it's saying it's got 13,000 font families. Now keep in mind, each family has a number of weights. So I can see here, if I zoom in a little bit, the Acumen Pro is from Adobe and it's got 18 weights. Um, we've got Litania, which is from Roy Abreu, and it has one weight. So each family that you deal with when you bring it into your application, you're going to bring all of the weights with them. A really important point to make here though, let's say that I do want to go with, um, pick something a little fun here. Uh, let's say I think Museo Slab would be an excellent choice. I can come take a look at the weights that are included here, and I may decide that I really only want to use, of all of the weights, I really only want to use one or two of them. When I select this family and load it into Muse, there's no real overhead to simply loading it into Muse. When I'm designing in my site, if I want to make sure I only use the 100 weight and the 300 weight, I need to make sure I only pick those two weights as I'm designing. If I pick less than all of the fonts, when Muse creates the type kit kit, that's part of what is uploaded in my design, it's going to subset that family down to only the fonts that are really being used in the design. So no fear that you're loading too many weights for your design. It won't make your site heavy unless you use more than a number of weights. So as I'm working here, I might decide that, sure, that's a great font. I'll go ahead and include it. And I'll jump back out. Or maybe I'm not so sure what I want. I can go into a filter here and say, you know what, I really like um, slab fonts. I like serif. Um, maybe I feel like getting a little bit of, well, we'll just go with a serif in this instance, maybe for body text. Um, and there are certain attributes I can play with here. I may want it to be condensed uh, or have old style characters. Obviously, you can point yourself into a corner to where there are no fonts that exemplify that. I'm a big fan of old style figures, so I may select that. And what's happening is the filter in the background is subsetting all of the fonts that are available for me in this window. So I can narrow it down and get a sense of what I do want to go with. And let's assume for a moment I want Capitola to be added. So I'm going to go ahead and check that box there. Notice I can also search across the Edge web fonts as I'm working. So if I don't even know too much what I'm looking for, I might just call it open. And I can see that in the Edge web font library, there's open sans and open sans condensed. I might type in condensed, and I can see that there are four condensed fonts, at least that have the name condensed in the name of the font, if that makes sense. And through that, I could come in and add additional fonts. So each time I'm checking any of these, they're included in what will be loaded into my app. If I click OK, Muse is going to go in, and you'll notice here it takes just a little bit of time to add the web fonts. Now there's an amazing magical feature that happens here. Let's say I'm working with Stephanie, and I'm going in to typeset this gorgeous page here. And I've gone in and selected some fonts that I want to work with. So we know in this example, this is um, one of the Edge web fonts, the open standard Google fonts that I'd like to work with. And I've selected that and I've loaded it in so it's, it's accessible within my application. If I send my source Muse file to Stephanie and she opens it up, the first time she opens it up, Muse is going to look to the file that I've sent her and it's going to see which typefaces are being used. And if need be, it'll make a query to the Edge web font server or the Typekit server, grab the faces that are necessary, and load it into her project. If she then says, well, that was great, saves the file, closes it out, hops on an airplane, open that file up again, Muse does a very good job of caching that typeface as part of your project. 
So even if she doesn't have internet access, she'll be able to see the fonts that I've selected that she downloaded to her system when she's on the plane. If she tries to preview in browser while she's on a plane and doesn't have any internet access, um, it may work, it may not. It depends on how you've cached that font. So if she previewed in browser before she closed out the file and hopped on the airplane, she'll probably get a good representation of the font in the browser. But for sure, when she lands, gets back on the internet, that access would be there. And she's free to design with the typeface in the application during the time that she does have um, no internet access if she's already loaded the font before she got on the plane. <laughs> okay, we're gonna talk about one more typeface example now, and that's gonna be the self-hosted font example. So let's say I do wanna work with those uh, two Ps, that two P typeface, because I know I wanna use those graphic elements easily in my design. What I do is I pull that under file to add files, not add files for upload, to add web fonts. Let's try that again, add and remove web fonts. And I'm gonna go ahead and click on the self-hosted tab here. Now I kinda of quickly mentioned this, when you're working with a self-hosted web font, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you double click on that type kit or that true type font to load it into your system before you come here. It just makes your process a little simpler. You can jump out and load it and come back. I believe Muse will auto sense if you've added a font into your system folder, but to be safe, you probably wanna do that before you load it into the Muse application. What I can do is come in and select add fonts. And you'll notice with self-hosted web fonts, I can either drag a folder onto this area or browse for a folder. And I have that bucket of all sorts of nice things there. So font self-hosting here. For example, I have a font that I did just to uh, talk about the weather. I wanted to have different weather icons. So I created a font awesome set of weather icons here. Um, we've got the two P's font set that we've talked about. I'm gonna go ahead and select that folder. And now we'll see if I actually loaded up the font the way I'm supposed to in advance. I'm not really sure. I went ahead and selected it. And Muse is gonna look in that folder for the, for the file formats that it needs. So I've got the WAF, the EOT, and the SVG. And these will be the source format that Muse needs to host that font. It looks like I've already loaded it into my system folder um, because I'm not seeing an error. Well, we'll see, give it a second. I'm gonna click continue. And indeed, I'm in good shape. So if I did not have it already loaded as a true type font in my system, I would be alerted here that I need to have it, um, but I'm in good shape. Now, if you have downloaded a font, let's say by way of Monotype or fonts.com or Font Squirrel, and there are licensing details that you're being asked to include with your site, you can add that licensing details here. Also, if the font that you're licensing has tracking code requirements, so Monotype and um, fonts.com, for example, you can enter that tracking code here so that when that hosting service does a query, you know that you've appropriately licensed the font. And that's up to each foundry to look at the rules that they have. But I've gone in and everybody's looking good here. I've got green across the board. So I can come in and click OK. And it's now adding that two P's font here. So as I'm working, I'm gonna to need to know which font from that icon font set I'm working with. Um, let's just give myself a little test here. A, B, C, I'm gonna select it. I'm gonna to go to my font dropdown now, and I wanna select two Ps. Now I've got a lot of fonts going on. I can come up into the filter by name here and just type the letter two or the number two. Um, and there's two Ps uh, dingbats, and I can select it. And now I can come in and basically see and access what I have. Well, that's the letters A, B, and C, and that's swell, but it's kind of gonna be painful for me to figure out which image is associated with which letter. So we help you out in that manner. If I pull that under window to the glyphs panel, the glyphs panel allow you to see a full character set. I can zoom in here, there's this cute little mountain scale thing. <laughs> a technical term uh, that allows you to see all of the fonts that are being used and notice I can even break into um, sometimes when there's numbers lowercase uppercase they'll be categorized and I can see that in a drop down in this area but I can come in and specifically select 
the image, the font that I want to work with. So if you're working with um, fonts that have special characters, different languages, using the glyphs panel is a good way to make your life easier in that work. Now, as I mentioned, there's pros and cons to how you do things. If I have this as a typeface, I can come in and pretty easily colorize my font using any of the colors that I have in my library. So if I come in and create a pretty custom color and I give it a name, pretty custom, and click OK, I can apply that to a font. If I place an SVG from Illustrator, I would not be able to apply that to my SVG in the same way. So there's an advantage to it being a font for that purpose. If I come into my color swatches panel, just somewhere here, and I've gone in and created a custom color, let's see, We laugh on the Muse team because we uh, install Muse so often we can't ever actually get our panels to be organized in a good way because the minute we invest in it, we install all over again and jump between betas, so it's kind of a futile effort. I'm going to come into my swatches panel here. I'll delete everything that's unused. There's that custom color that I created. If I come in and change its value, let's say I really think that um, a happier shade of pink would be better. When I click OK, because I applied that named color, it's updating that icon for me because it's sort of a style that's been attached to that font. All right, uh, I'm going to take a look and see how the world's going, and then we're going to jump into kind of the next section on this topic. So Q&A, nobody's got anything. Chat, anything big. So. If any of the moderators have anything you want to throw at me, give me a shout. It's looking pretty quiet. Y'all are mesmerized, which is good. Or you're sleeping. There'll be a test later, so pay attention. <laughs> okay, let me keep going. All right, so that's a little bit about how to load a font as you're working. And as I mentioned, you do want to be prudent about how many fonts you're loading in your site. And you can do some benchmark testing to see how long it's taking for fonts to load up. There are different speed tests from different companies, tools like Google will give you a speed test that lets you see how well that font is performing in your site. Um, let's come in and grab some of that Greeking again. And we're going to talk a little bit about styles. So as I'm working, if I do get something that I think is just fabulous, that I want to populate across my site, I can easily create styles for that text to apply across the site. So if I did think that this was the most fabulous headline, I can come in and continue to iterate on it. So if I come into my text panel, I can decide text attributes associated with this. So I may come in and change the color to my beautiful shade of pink, and I can set attributes like tracking. I may decide that I want to apply just a little bit of tracking to my headline. I may decide that I want it to be title in case or all caps for my headline. And I'm going to go ahead and make this a little smaller so that I can make my headline a bit larger. I may also decide some spacing attributes where at, after each headline there's maybe 20 pixels of space that I want to apply. And that would be my headline style. For my body text, we'll kind of leave it pretty vanilla. I can come in and because it is best practices with the web, I'll probably add a little bit more leading, maybe 140% leading. But that's looking pretty good to me now. If I decided I wanted to use this in many places on my design, I can select some text. And in my paragraph styles, I can come in and set attributes. Now, there's merit to differentiating here real quickly between character styles and paragraph styles. When I first started working on Muse, it was in beta, it was private beta, it wasn't even public beta, and I went in and I applied styles, and I used character styles, um, and I did the wrong thing, basically. In the world of InDesign, so this is kind of a legacy behavior, InDesign says that if you wanted to have certain points of emphasis, so let's say the word organic, I really, really, really wanted it to be um, a bold weight, 
and uh, I wanted, I don't, I'm trying to think about tragic things that I might do it. I might underline it, and I don't know. Italicize it. Uh, I can come in and create a character style. So if I call this uh, something, and click OK, the idea is that I could go in and apply that character style within a block of paragraph text, right? Um, so it's for individual words is the way I would phrase it, rather than characters, probably word versus paragraph styling. Inversely, I'm going to undo that because I don't want to confuse anybody here too much. I mean the computer here for a second. So if I came in and had set everything I want with my parag paragraph style attributes, so if I go back up here and I've even gone in and set maybe 10 pixels of space between my paragraphs, all of these attributes, the color, the weight, um, any of the spacing attributes can be saved as part of my paragraph style. So I can come in and give this a title, and I might call this body. Now notice that in the P tag, the paragraph tag drop down area here, I have some choices. This is really important to pay attention to. The idea is that when a search engine is crawling your site, if you've got a page full of text, there may be a hierarchical priority about the text on your page. There's probably what's known as an H1 or a headline. That's the most important thing on the page for a search engine to search. And it may be a statement about, obviously, the product you're selling or the attention that you're going to want to get. Defining something as an H1 is going to give it the highest priority when a search engine is crawling that page. A P tag or a paragraph tag is usually what you apply to body text. And it's going to de-emphasize that text and not have it rank as high when that search engine is crawling your page. So I'm going to stick with a P tag here for my body text. And I'm going to come in and select a second one. And we'll call it my headline. And for that, I'm going to go ahead and set an H1 or a headline tag. Notice that it's including all of these attributes as we're working. So I'll click OK. And what I can easily do now is come to these other blocks of text and just apply the headline. Again, this guy's pretty long and big. We'll let the man bun stay, because that's very hipster. Um, I have a question for you. What is the fashion statement for women that are hipsters? I know exactly what a guy hipster look like, looks like, because I'm in San Francisco in the mission. But women hipsters, I actually had to research it. It's a funny, more subtle thing. It's not as apparent as a male hipster. Just saying. That's my comment for the day. All right, so we've got our headlines applied. I'll come on into my hipster body text, and I'll apply the body text tag. So now as I'm working, if I come in and say, wow, you know those headlines are looking a little beefy for me? I could go and redefine this attribute. I may say, let's make it a little smaller. And I've gone in and applied the change that I just made, my point size, to just one block of text. Notice that my paragraph style has a little plus now. It's saying it's based on the style that I defined, but if I roll over it, I can see all of the attributes that are associated with that paragraph style with a line that says you've altered it slightly to change the point size to 34 points. Now, if I know I want to make that change apply to everything that's been defined with that style, what I can do is with the object selected and the change made, I can right click on headline and I can either undo that override, I can bring it back to the original point size, or I can redefine the style to match the current select set. If I redefine the style, you may not have seen it, but on the left, these two other headlines applied that change. Okay, we are cooking with steam, folks. Let's go back to the street art man bun. And um, let's say I had, instead of just text here, I also had a list here. So I'm going to go ahead and hit some hard return for this silly little text. Street art vine, a hella man braid. You never know what's going to come up here. I hope there's nothing inappropriate. So, okay. I'm going to leave this. Um, <laughs> It's kind of fun. All right, I'm going to leave some of these sections. So I have basically gone in and quickly created a list. So I've hit a hard return between each of these sections. 
what I want to be able to do is have a bulleted list for this text. So for that, I'm going to come in and select what I'm working with, and I want to create a, a bullet style in essence. I'll start with one of them, and instead of paragraph styles or character styles, I'm going to go ahead and select the bullet styles panel. And there's nothing there right now, interestingly, because I haven't set any styles yet. I'm going to pull down on window to select bullets. All right, bullets allow me to come in and define bullets with my design. Now, this is a pretty powerful feature. We've leveraged a lot of our wisdom from InDesign, which is probably one of the most amazing typesetting tools that's out there, I think, with a good 15 years of engineering behind it. Um, when it comes to bullets, you have a lot of choices. So I can come in here and select from bullets that are included with the font that I have loaded. So for this particular typeface, Stint Ultra Condensed, that font has three bullet types, and they're reflected here in this drop-down panel. So I could just say, you know what, go ahead and apply a bullet to the text, and it's going to use the bullet associated with this typeface. Now, perhaps I want to use a bullet from a different font. What I can do in that instance is, let me just see, I have to remind myself. Hmm. Okay. By default, when I came in, let's just undo what I did here for a moment. I just went and selected some text, and I clicked on the bullet drop-down to select from that which is default to the font. Uh, and in the little toggle button there, I either turned it on or off. So I turned it on, and then when I turned it on, I can choose which bullet within that font I want to work with. Well, maybe I don't want that bullet in that font. In the area just below, it's showing me, you know what, Danny, for the text you have selected, the auto bullet is going to be leveraging the same font. I can come in, though, and say, you know what, that's adorable, but I really want to use this funny font called 2P's Dingbats. And when I do that, in theory, let's see, uh, I can come in and choose, it's a very good point, how do I pick from there now? Okay, follow me. Uh, what I've done is I've said instead of using the default font, I want to use a different font, two P's Dingbats. And in the drop down, I'm going to select new character. And this allows me to come in. There's not a lot of bullets in that font. Remember, it's just a bunch of funny pictures. But I can go in and look at the entire font and select, um, well, let me see, the closest thing to a bullet, which is this basketball. And I can add it click OK, and now apply that. OK, <laughs> I know, this is really high fashion. In addition to that, I can't even come in and control the color of that font. So I may decide that it should use that very pretty, pretty pink. <laughs> Feeling very girly today. Uh, very, very pretty pink basketball. I've gone in and created a custom bullet at this point. What I can do is now create a bullet style that I apply. So this is my pretty, pretty bullets. I'm going to click OK. If you're still with me, wake up if you're sleeping. I'm going to select a block of text here. And notice it's grayed out in the bullet styles. That's OK. I have to tell it I want a bullet first. So I'll come back into that bullet panel, toggle it on, and then I go to my bullet styles, and I can apply the pretty, pretty bullet style. Now, in my bullet options, there are some interesting additional attributes. Based on the bullet you're using, you're going to want to adjust things like the amount of space between the bullet and your text. You can also control how, uh, how close the bullets are to the text column on the left. So the space to the left of the bullet and the space to the right of the bullet can be controlled here. And once you fiddle a bit and like the look of it, you can even move the bullet up or down. So based on the bullet you have, this basketball looks a little high to me. So I can come in and move that down just a bit. Any of the subtle changes I've just made here, notice I get that plus sign again saying pretty, pretty um, is now different than the style that I originally defined. I can right click and say redefine the style with those subtle changes, and it's going to apply that to all of the bullets that are there. 
All right, it's 9.55, which means I've sucked up almost the entire hour on amazing typographic thingamabobs. Um, I am going to go ahead and ask you one more polling question. Well, before we jump into our last poll, um, I'm going to jump into chat and see if there's any outstanding questions, any Q&A questions that are out there. Did we cover everything you wanted to hear today around typography? Is there something that you expected to hear that we didn't get that you can throw into the chat really quickly? Everybody says all good. I'm going to, uh, I want to get official feedback, so I'm going to go ahead and throw up one more poll, which is how well do we cover the topics today? If you say it fell below expectations, I demand that you tell me why by putting it into the chat. And uh, open question for the crowd, what would you like to talk about in two weeks? Um, I usually pull from the goodie bag of things I haven't talked about in a long time, uh, but I'm definitely open to different topics if there's things that you'd like to cover. I think the idea of responsive design is an endless, endless topic. Um, I might circle back on that one in two weeks and just really take door to door all of the capabilities with responsive. Um, but is there anything else on your mind? The last thing I do want to mention is in the chat there, there's the sessions with type and moments with type. Um, moments with type has some terrific best practices. Aaron Lawrence uh, put in a lot of late nights, I think, on that design. But he really did gather all of the relevant. I think that's amazing as a web designer in news is you don't care about the code. It's not your responsibility. Uh, what your responsibility is is to design intelligently using best practices for the web so the viewers of your site can have the best experience. And Aaron's tutorial there, it's really worth clicking through and seeing all of the examples he gives because they really relate to Muse and best practices around typography and web design. Looks like we got a request for new widget websites and resources. So uh, just to let everybody know, the best place to, if you go to musewidgets.com, um, it is the same as muse.adobe.com going to the widget directory, but that's just a nice shortcut to get there. There's over 700 widgets that some are free, some cost a little bit of money, um, some are part of a subscription from some of our partners, but there's huge, huge um, expansion of the base Muse application by way of the widget world when you want to extend Muse functionality. Um, if you want to talk specifically around new widget websites and resources, tell me a little bit more about what you're looking for if that's a topic you want to cover. So will any of the Muse theme websites update their templates? So if you mean Muse theme, um, Steve Harris's company, he has done some of it to redesign his templates to be responsive. Um, I think his intention is for all things that are going forward to make them responsive. I'm not sure he's going to go in and redo all of his older templates. We also have Ali Pordelli from cookie.com. He is another template provider. Um, I think going forward, they will be responsive. There's definitely you know, steps that you can take to take an existing website and convert it to a responsive design. Um, so you can use the old templates and create additional breakpoints and resize it. But um, I think that, as I mentioned, going forward, they'll definitely do it. I think Muse Themes probably has 80 different templates, and I'm not sure if they're going to actually redo all of them to make them responsive. Mr. Portelli is answering a question. Looking for a widget like the social locker for WordPress. Okay, well there is, um, in the widget directory, there's a submit a request if you don't see what's there. I do share those with the vendors from time to time um, to let them know what people are requesting. So that's a good way to kind of filter that through. You can also poke at Ali while he's here. He um, probably more than templates developed some pretty terrific widgets. All right, people, I think we're going to stop for now. I will see you again in two weeks. Thank you, everyone, for your time. And um, we look forward to seeing you again. And if you would like to watch this recording or other recordings, be sure to look at our YouTube channel. Um, there's everything that we've done in the past along with this recording. We will catch you in two weeks. Thanks, folks.